Hey everybody, thanks for joining me here today for Memorable Travel and Stock Photography presented by our friend and pro travel photographer Scott Stolberg. Hey Scott. Hey, how you doing Nicole? Good, thanks for joining us here today. No problem. All right, so just a couple quick things before I hand it over to Scott. First, if you have any questions, you can type them into your questions um, module on your GoToWebinar panel. You can um, also wait until the end and we'll be answering some questions. Ashley Robinson and myself will be typing some questions into you during the presentation and then Scott will answer some at the end. If you're having any trouble with your screen or your sound, usually minimizing your screen will help to fix any issues or logging off and logging back in will solve that as well if you shut down any other programs that might be running. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about Scott and then we will go ahead and get started. Like I said, Scott is a professional travel photographer, travel and stock photographer, and he has been our friend for a really long time. He's been um, part of the Topaz development and his suggestions are definitely highly valued here. Beyond Topaz, he journeys and does workshops in, all over the globe. He also teaches digital photography and Photoshop at many schools, including UCLA Extension and the Julia Dean Photo Workshops, which are in Hollywood, California. He's also a contributing writer for Shutterbug, which is really cool. He's um, also is a co-author of the Digital Photographer's New Guide to Photoshop Plugins. Again, he um, teaches tons of workshops in America and abroad, and we are super happy to have him here this afternoon. And with that, I will go ahead and give it over to you. Okie dokie. <laughs> Show my screen. So let me know when you see my screen. I see it. So we're all set to go? Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, welcome everybody. Yeah, like uh, Nicole said, I love working in Photoshop and been using Photoshop since I can remember. Probably since version 2. It was a natural uh, kind of... Uh, way to go after the dark room. I had a dark room ever since I was a little kid, since I was 13. So Photoshop was just the next transition to, uh, to all this technology. It was great. So probably since version 2. And um, I used to run a lot of uh, uh, graphics user groups and just somehow got really into plugins and actions. And I absolutely love plugins. That's why I, I wrote a book on plugins, some of the best in the world. And, and I love I love great software, and so I've been having all the companies, you know, they, they come in or I do demos on all of their software uh, for years and years now, probably 15 years now. And, um, God, years ago, uh, I forget when, but I met Eric from Topaz. Uh, Eric and his father, Albert, they're the, the brains behind the outfit, along with Nicole and Ashley and everyone else. And um, I just love their software. I, I, I just, it's, it's software whose time has come, and it's so needed. And no matter where I travel, uh, I have my laptop with me. Uh, uh, if there's one plug-in on there, I mean, they have so many great ones, but Topaz Adjust is something that I really can't go anywhere without. So I love their stuff. Um, and um, and they've been really cool. They've been uh, letting me help uh, them with their software and help design their, their newer interface that we're going to see. So uh, I'm going to kind of bounce around between these four today. Adjust, simplify, remask, and detail. I use them all. Uh, and uh, it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis what I really want to use. And they don't use them on every image, but depending on what I want to do, I'll say, well, make, I think today I want to work on this man from India with adjust. Sometimes I, I know what I need and this one I think is a uh, is a great piece of software. Hang on a second, I'm missing my stuff. This is a great piece of software for bringing in the detail that I really need and you can kind of see when I go from just my original image here and then I add topaz, you can see what happens and then I will add another topaz part and then I added another one here. So what I'm going to do is just kind of show you basically how you can do this really easily. I'm going to flatten that right now and I'm going to make a layer copy. These are my actions here make things a little easier. So with, with Topaz you want to make a layer copy, go up and then let's go grab Topaz Adjust. My favorite cool little thing. So I like to make a layer copy first otherwise once you do it you won't really have the control you need afterwards to play with it. So to me, everything in Photoshop revolves around layers. It's incredibly important. 
<clears throat> so this is a this is the interface. Uh, it used to be a lot different. It was white. A lot of this stuff, the sliders were on the bottom, and I got to work with them and changed all the colors here. So I put in all the gray and the and the darker gray. Uh, put all the presets over here. Um, we used to have more thumbnails over here, but we have one up here to make things load quicker. And what you can do is you can go through these one by one and kind of see some of these really great presets. Or um, what I also had built in was to use your arrow keys. So for those of you who don't, don't know that, you can just, right now, I'm hitting my arrow key down. And I can scroll right through the presets. A lot of the time, I like this better. Uh, because the little, the little window up here really sometimes doesn't give me exactly what I want to see. And if you want to work a little bit faster, all you have to do is make the screen a little bit smaller. And you can, uh, you can go through these things with your arrow key, and it actually will, they will work quicker. So if I, if I hit one over here and I go through one, it's much quicker. But I'm going to work full screen, so we take advantage of all the real estate. And, um, and then you have, obviously, I'm sure you've seen some of these webinars before, or uh, there's a lot of videos on their site. These are all the controls over here, so I will, I will get into these also. But it's really a beautiful layout. This is about as pretty as it comes. Uh, I'm so glad I was able to work on this with them. And almost every suggestion I gave them, they, they listened and they worked with, and I absolutely just love this software. I love the layout. It's as pretty and as intuitive as it gets. On this, pretty, on this particular image, though, with this, with this guy, I'm going to hit Reset All. That's where I usually start down here. So if I'm going a little fast, just tell me to slow down. I'm going to hit reset, and that's my image. So when I click on the image, or I use the space bar, I also put this in here also, so it's real easy. If you choose something, you can just hit the space bar instead of using your mouse click. And I do this a lot because I'm working over here with my mouse, and I want to see the before and after. So if I do something like full adaptive exposure to the right, I go, well, what did it look like before? I don't want to have to move over and click. So I'll move this, and I'll click with my left hand on the space bar. So I'm very, very much into speed, and that's just the way that I work. And uh, I'm kind of like Nicole. She likes to make huge jumps. So sometimes I'll come all the way over here and make a jump. I'll come over here, and I'll see where do I want. What I'm going to do on this image is I'm going to scroll down here, and I think for this one what I liked was a pretty hardcore one. And you'll see how I work with it. I'm going to hit Spiceify. And there's my there's my crazy man. This was in India. I was I was leaving the Jasmer, photographing camels in the desert in uh, sunrise and sunset settings. And I came back with one of my students. Actually, I was traveling in India with one of my students. We went into a restaurant in the middle of nowhere, and this guy is standing at the entrance for like a dollar to take a picture of him. I'm like, okay, no problem. Put up my tripod, shot him for like five minutes, and um, and it was just a, an amazing experience. But I wanted to get a little more detail. So if I click on here, you could see it was a little bright out there, like India is, and um, that's why I chose Spiceify. And what I, what I usually do is, is I come in here, and one of the things that you can look for is this one right here that says Process Details Independent of Exposure. And I think what this does is it, 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 it can keep the colors looking nice, but it gets rid of that over-processed, gritty, yitty, lucky look. Okay, So watch what happens when I click on this. It mellows it out just a little bit. It's kind of what I wanted. This doesn't always work. Um, just like in Simplify, changing it out of RGB into the other color space doesn't always work. Um, this one doesn't always work, but for this image, it's working. And what I want to do is maybe now bring back a little bit of my details. So I'm going to go before and after. And right now, if I like it, I can just hit a snapshot of it. I'm, I'm not going to because I know what I want. And I'm going to go before and after, before and after. I always do this. I'm constantly... I want to see what I need to do. And then what I'll, maybe I'll do a little bit more is I'll, I'll pump up my boost details. I go a little bit at a time. And I realize it's too much. I'm going to back it off. So I do this a lot. I'll go up, and then I'll back off. I want to see, did I do too much? Yes, I did. And then I back off. I do the same thing in Photoshop all the time. I like the way it's looking, except I still want to work on his face. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to bring him. Now he's my layer copy right here. right? This is why you have to be working in layers. The most important thing, in my opinion, was I think back when Photoshop hit version 2.5 or 3, they brought in layers. They took it from the program Painter, where it was called Floaters, and it was revolutionary. We didn't have to work in channels now all the time. So layers, I'm telling you, is there's nothing more important you need to master than layers. The next thing that's the most important thing, in my opinion, in Photoshop are layer masks. Layer masks is just a 
dumb term, nutty term for painting in and painting out so that you don't have to sit here and do selections here and paint in this area right here or whatever. You can just paint in his face or paint out his face. So let me show you how that will work. I like the image, but I want to soften his face a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make another layer copy at any time if I wanted to, by the way. I could double click here and just say that this is adjust if I wanted to. What I'm going to do is make a layer copy of this by dragging it down here or hitting Command J or going up here. There's five different ways. I'm going to go back to Topaz Adjust 4. It's going to bring this up again. It's probably going to hit Spicify again. I don't want to do that. So what I want to do is just soften his face a little bit. I'm going to come probably into what I want to do. I think it's Portrait Smooth. Now, it's kind of yucky. It's not the way I want it to look. So probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to immediately back off the saturation, which is hiding because I didn't close my tabs here. Um, and I'm going to back off a little bit on this. Okay, so his face is looking smoother. I'm going to come back. See, I'm not looking at anything else. The way you work with layers and layer masks is you pay attention to the area that you want to work on, nothing else. I'm looking at his hands, and I'm looking at his face. And I'm looking in here, and I'm going, okay, it's still not there. So what I want to do is probably um, bring up a little bit more of the let – me, let me just play with this a little bit until I get his face a little more yummy. And I might even play with the regions a little bit. I'm going to close color. I'm going to open up details. And I'm going to probably bring in just a little, little bit more strength. And now I'm going to look before and after. Okay. So I'm just looking at his face, looking at his hands before and after. That's kind of where I want to be. This isn't exactly uh, you know, going to be my finished product, but I'm, I want to just show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit OK. OK, so now I'm going to switch to my Wacom tablet so that I can paint in. Whenever you're using layers and layer masks, you usually want to use your Wacom tablet or Wacom tablet, however you want to pronounce it. So here is after, here's before. So what I'm going to do now is come up to Layer, Layer Mask, Hide All. That's going to put a black mask in front of the adjust that I just did and bring me back to this one, which means I can steal from this one and paint it onto this one. It's, I'm just telling you, the most important thing you could ever learn <laughs> in Photoshop, in my opinion. There's no number two or number three. It's layers and layer masks. Okay, so black is my color, which means white has to be the opposite for me to paint in. I'm going to grab my brush. And then, since I have my brush selected, I'm going to grab my opacity for my brush up here. And I don't care. Any number is going to work pretty much as long as it's above 50%. And I'm going to make the brush a little bigger with my bracket keys. And I'm going to start painting in the softness on his face. And that, that easily. I can also zoom in and take away some of this orange color that happened to kind of get into his mustache a little bit. I can make a smaller brush if I wanted to. And come down here. I'm not going to waste my time with that now. I'm going to come in here, paint this out. See what I'm doing? I'm stealing. I'm stealing some of this and putting it on this one down here. So let me look at his hands. Oh, I want to steal some of I want to get his hands looking. Oh, there we go. I blew it by keeping his watch on. Yeah, don't get mad at me. One of those. Dang, I should have seen that. Okay, so um, there we go. And now I realize by doing this, if I turn this, if I, if I turn if I turn this uh, on or off, his eyes went a little bit darker, which means I really want to bring back in just the eyes but leave the face like that. So I'm going to push this back to black, and then I can come in here and paint back in the sharpness of his eyes. So I can go backwards and forwards, stealing from this one or this one, and now we can see before and after that quickly. And um, there's before. There's with adjust, and there's adjust a second time to soften the face and soften the hands. So that's kind of like my workflow. I, I love adjust. It does so many great things. And on this image, I know you've seen it on the front of the Topaz website. It's been on there a long time. Eric really liked this one. And I thought it really portrayed a good before and after on how to use this plugin. It, it, if there's one thing I hate, I think I, have to, I tell all my students, the one thing with Photoshop, is you don't want it to look like you've used Photoshop. You really don't. And I see with a lot of HDR, which I teach a lot of, a lot of HDR techniques and processing, uh, they're so overdone 
and over the top. I can't stand it. So I'm a big believer in if you're going to even do HDR, make it look realistic. So I add topaz to a lot of my HDR images, or I will take an image like this and make it look a little bit more natural, a little bit more HDR without too much HDR. I don't think people look at this and go, oh yeah, they used HDR. Oh yeah, he used topaz. Um, a lot of people don't know and they really like it. I, I have it on one of my business cards and people really don't. They just think, ah, oh, it's a lot of impact. And uh, anyway, just be careful you don't overdo it. With Topaz, especially with Adjust, it's easy, easy, easy to overdo it. So let me open another one here. And this one I used, uh, I used uh, Simplify and Adjust. So let me see if I can hit this. Nope, it hides my, hides my tools. This is kind of weird. So I have to get back with the screen showing. Sorry about that. Sorry about this little mess. Um, so this was the original image. This is uh, shooting the uh, Oakland Bay Bridge. I highly recommend people not to try this shot. There's a cliff there about, God, must have been 50, 75 feet. I could have fallen down. And it's against the law to be right where <laughs> this is. It's U.S. government property, signs everywhere. But I knew the shot I wanted to get. I knew the place I wanted to get. I love San Francisco. Uh, but it was worth the, the challenge here. But I could have easily gone to jail. Or I could have died. I was shooting on a cliff. I could have fallen over another two feet, and I would have been crushed. But this was the angle I wanted to get, and it was a very foggy night. In fact, I almost didn't go shoot. My girlfriend and I were sitting in the car for an hour before, way over on the other side where everybody does sit and watch the bay, and um, I almost gave up. It was so murky, but I knew as the lights would come on in San Francisco that the detail would pop up, the haze would dissipate a little, and I knew in my mind if there's anything that's going to save this image, it's topaz, and it's without a doubt. But it really uh, is the truth. So what I did was, um, I'm not going to do this for you. I'm going to show you what I did on this particular one. I'm just going to do one layer, I think, of adjust for you. But look what I did. I did adjust, and I did simplify. I did topaz and simplify again, and then I did topaz again. So I do multiple layers of topaz, adjust, and simplify because sometimes that's what it takes. But a lot of these plugins that you buy, people think, oh, I'll just run it once, or I'll just use the preset, do nothing else. And no, no, the reason I wrote my book on Photoshop plugins, because there's so much more to know about plugins. You can do one effect once, and then you can do another effect, and then another two effects, and then another effect. And you can add them all up and get something really special. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to flatten this. I'm going to do a layer copy, and I'm going to come back into one of my favorite plugins. And on this one, I think, you know, I can go through here. Actually, I'm going to hit reset all again. I'm going to come through here, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to go through some of these presets, and I'm going to look here. Actually, I'll just scroll down. But I think for this particular one, I'm going to go to crisp. Right off the bat, crisp feels good to me, and I really don't really even need to do that much more, except I notice that it adds noise. One of the things about Topaz, it easily can add noise to your images. So they have a great little noise reduction capability built in, and if you want, you can use their denoise um, capability down here, which is insanely cool, or probably the most amazing noise reduction <laughs> technique I've ever used. Uh, but you don't want to use it unless you have time because it's going to take some time. I could actually put in some suppression right now and watch. It goes pretty quick. And I'm looking up here at the noise, and boom, that noise is gone. I'm going to zoom in to show you. I just hit Command Plus on the Mac, and I'm going to, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more and pull this down. Um, okay, so there is still some noise going on in here, which means so I would probably, I mean, this is going to, this is great. You can go over this, and it tells you exactly whatever slider does, which is cool. So if I want to make the small details a little bit less, I'm going to pull this to the left, and I might even maybe pull my strength to the left, just a hair, and then I'm going to click with my space bar on and off, and that's pretty good. And enhance the noise just a little bit, probably not too much to bother me, but I really want to see what this looks like kind of full screen. So. The cool thing is we can get rid of this. I, I've picked crisp. I don't need this anymore. I'm just going to click over here on the left, and that's gone. And now I can see my image full screen. Now is when I want to do my space bar. I don't want to be clicking on the screen. This is not what I want. Before and after. And I really, I'm really starting to like this. And then I decide, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to come down to my, um, my uh, 
color and work with my saturation. This is going to kind of adaptive saturation. It's going to kind of even out the tones. Uh, let's see. It's probably going to add too much color. Let's see. Well, it added some color, but it did a better job than, watch this. If I add regular saturation, it's going to probably be gaudy. Yeah, so be really careful of saturation. Little baby steps with saturation. And I think it's still too much. I'm going to back off a little bit. And I kind of like that. So um, before and after. I didn't, that's pretty remarkable for me. This I really, really love what Topaz did. There's some images that I have that I know are so much more powerful and exactly what I wanted, and it's all because of this software. So um, before and after, I'm not even going to do one more thing. I'm not going to bring in Simplify. I'm not going to run Topaz again. This is exactly the feeling I wanted, and that's how my image uh, probably end up. So let me close up this one. Any questions so far, or do we wait till the end, Nicole? Um, we do have a question about all those beautiful actions that you have <laughs> in your Photoshop. Um, are those something that you actually imported or created each one yourself? I knew someone was going to ask about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, the actions is a way to, well, just to me as, as important as plugins are, um, actions are really important because I can do anything that I want if I want to go to uh, uh, turn something horizontally, I can just do it in one touch. I can also assign an F key or, or a, a keys, keys stroke to do this. Uh, anything that I want to do, I can, if I want to bring up um, to, if I want to bring up Topaz Adjust 4, boom, I just click on it and brings it up. If I want to uh, bring up a hue saturation, uh, anything I want to do. So these are things that you can make and I'm not going to get into uh, how, you, how you do that, but you just come over here and you start playing with your actions. You get into the button mode and this is all these controls down here and all the stuff over here. You learn how to do that. So if you don't know how to do actions, it will speed up everything. Everything becomes one click. And at the same time, like for my stock agency, this says Corbis. If I want this image, I can hit it. It will resize it exactly how I want. It will turn it into a JPEG. It might change the color space. Put it in a folder that I, that I want. It will close the original and not save it, and boom. Maybe it will do 10, 20 steps with a, with just like that. So this will do one step. 20 steps, whatever you want, or just bring up a simple dialog box that you want. I can go right to my print. Anyway, that's what actions do. And I usually put my plugins right in here so I don't even have to go here. I make it so that I can have it make a layer copy first and then bring up the plugin so that I don't have to make even one first. It does it automatically. So actions are really, really cool for those people out there that uh, really want to work a little bit faster. I'm, in all, I'm all into working. It's called work. Flow, not work slow, as Seth Resnick says. <laughs> okay, I'm going to. Um, Seth is great. I'm going to um, show you how I did this real easily. This is um, another easy way to use Topaz. And this is a little girl from from. Um, I, I left my uh, my workshop last uh, December and went to. Um, I went to Koh Phangan. It's a beach in Thailand for about two weeks with my girlfriend, and um, this was a little girl from Holland that was so adorable with her white glasses, and I. Five minutes before they left and went to grab the taxi to take the boat back to uh, Koh Samui, um, she was dying to have me photograph her. And so I, I, I lifted this beach bench, uh, I mean this uh, lounge chair, and put it right where the water hits the sand. So she was actually, the water was coming up, and I put my girlfriend's scarf underneath her, and I had her lay on her hands and wear her sunglasses. And she was so excited. She was so getting into photography. And so I took the image, and um, I want to show you how I just intensified it a little bit with Topaz, because I like it, but I wanted to make it pop a little bit more. And sometimes, uh, just as, e as important as these actions are, are notes. And notes are these things right here. I can make a note and put it right in here. If you want to know where your notes are, are, just where everything else is, your notes are right here. And you click on, uh, I think notes are uh, right here, your note tool in CS5. You click on the image, it will make this little thing. And then you can start typing in here, you know, have fun and blah, 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 blah. So whatever you do, for those of you who go, I can't remember what I did, just start typing in here and then hit Command S or Control S and save the image. All of this will go with you, including the little thing that shows you have a note, and you'll remember everything that you did. So as you're working, you do five more things, you go, oh, by the way, and then I did this and I did this and blah, 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 blah. So that's, uh, that's what I do here with my notes. And what I put here was I used Topaz. 
using the caddy preset. That was a Cadillac uh, that I'll probably show later preset. Then backed off on the details. So there's too much noise. Then did a layer mask hide all. So I can I can remember exactly what I did in case I forgot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a layer copy. You see how easy that was? Make a layer copy, and I'm going to come back up to this very cool plugin that I just started using. Just kidding. <laughs> um, and what I want to do in here is probably um, bring back my presets. And like I said, you can come through here. Um, you come through here. I'm going to hit the first one, and maybe let me see here. Oh, it doesn't want to uh, show me the rest of them. So I'm going to go to the one that I think works the best, which is dramatic. And I'm going to make her a little bit smaller. So I'm not sure what's going on. There we go. Let's see. Fit. There we go. Little boo boo. Okay. So here we are. Dramatic. Now, obviously, <laughs> she doesn't look too good, does she? But many times, like I'm working with a layer mask, I pay no attention to certain parts of the image, especially in adjust. I'm only looking at the background, the bench, and the little sarong. So before and after, just from dramatic, but it's going to ruin her face and her arms. I don't care. So I'm looking at this, and I might come in a little bit. And I love playing with the region slider, which is really cool. Um, this, this, the adaptive slider up here that I love, the adaptive exposure, it kind of balances the tonal values. So this is really, I mean, this is to me the heart and soul of topaz. But you have to kind of back it up with the regions. Now the regions breaks down the image into these little squares. It's a little technical. Um, the more regions, the more HDR it's looking, and, and the more tones it's affecting. Some of these images will just get ruined by pulling the region slider to the rest, to, to the right. Some images will look better with it to the right. So this is kind of like you're playing mix and match over here with these two, and then you start working with the rest. But all I'm going to do on this particular image is probably bump up my adaptive saturation just a bit. Go back before, and let me see before and after. Really don't want to do too much. I might, I might bump up my uh, details a little bit, and maybe a little boost. There we go. Okay, I like what I'm doing. I'm gonna hit OK. All right, so I'm gonna grab my Wacom again here, and <laughs> she doesn't look too good. So what I'm gonna do is, does anybody know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna come up here, and I'm gonna go layer. Layer mask, hide all. Um, it's back to the normal one. I just hit it with the black. There's black. I've got to change this to the white. People don't realize how important these swatches are. They are the heart and soul of Photoshop. So you have to pay attention to these guys. This is black. This is white. Now I'm going to grab my brush. And I think I can go any percentage I want. I'm just going to leave it at 84 again. Not a big deal. And now watch. I'm going to start painting in again, just like this. And watch. I'm going to go over that. I'm going to make it a little smaller. Now watch when I go across the front. I'll, I'll put you 100% so you can see better. Watch this. See that? I'm going to undo that. Look what I just did to the bench because of topaz. I added more grit. I'm going to come in here and get the rest of the scarf. Come over here and get a bigger brush again. Oops, I moved the note tool, sorry. And I'm going to just start painting in the background. Now I'm using a feathered, feathered brush. A little secret in CS5 is that you can hold down the control and the option key on the Mac, and I can go up or down and change my hardness this way, or sideways, left or right, and make the brush bigger or smaller. So remember that. I'm not doing anything. I'm not moving. My Wacom is on there, and I'm just... So this is really, really a nice, a really nice shortcut. Uh, so I want a feathered brush about that size. I'm going to start painting in. And um, OK, and now let's look at the before and after. Before and after. So I just used Topaz to give me some cool punch and color, especially down here and grit. Look, look what I did. Look, look, at, look at the detail. I'm going to zoom in here. Look at the detail I got in here. But I didn't mess up her face. Watch what her face would have been if I kept it there. So she would not have been happy. Uh, she stayed pen pals with me. And um, <laughs> I hope I run into her again in, in, uh, in Thailand um, or Holland, where, where I love to go. But um, the, the difference is night and day. I brought in some of the background there. And I kept her face the same. So remember that. Topaz is not always for the entire image. Topaz can be for part of the image. And you can paint in and paint out whatever you want. So onward and upward. Any other questions? Are we doing OK? Is I every, think we are. Yet? We are no. doing good. Yeah, go ahead. OK, cool. All right. 
This is an image that I did on my last workshop. I showed people how to shoot these kind of images. And um, after I shot it, I didn't realize, but it reminded me of Steve McCurry's Afghan Girl, which is not what I was going for. I just love shooting monks. I'm probably going to do a book on monks. I shoot them a lot. Um, and he was in the school there in Mandalay. And I brought some of my students over. And I showed him, if you take the, the rope off of their body, I put it over his head, which I rarely do. And it looked beautiful. I loved the look that I got. And I kept playing with it till I liked it, right? But that's the original image right there. This is after using tilt pads. It's exactly what I wanted. I wanted some more grit, some more drama. So I really liked the feeling there. The background went a little bit green, which was perfect. That was the schoolhouse. And oh, look, here's a note. Let's see what I said. Um, on the crisp, OK, I used crisp. I used the adaptive slider, went to details. <clears throat> so I can read read exactly what I did. I, uh, I pulled down the shot. OK, so what we're going to do is this is great. If I ever, if I ever like, what did I do? I just go right there if I have one of these on my image. So I'm going to flatten this. I'm going to make a layer copy. You know where to flatten. It's up bottom over here. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to go to pass, adjust for. Let's see if I can remember exactly what I did. I'm actually going to grab my my uh, mouse instead of my Wacom. And oh, I remember what it's okay. I'm going to hit reset all. But I remember what it said in that thing. I used a crisp preset. So I can look through these and see what I want, but I'm actually probably going to go to my crisp preset. This, this, is a, this is a good preset. I have some of my favorites. And you know what I can do is I can make tons of changes. And I can do all kinds of different things. And I can pull this over and do this and do that. And then I can hit Save. And I can put the name here. And I can put it in what category that I want. And I can even check these off. It'll be good for that also, created by Nicole. And um, I can put a description in here. And then I can hit OK. And what happens is you start ending up, see all these over here on the left over here? These are all presets with different names. And they, they remind me of what I did, because I give it a name, Burma Girl Smiling on the Bridge. Otherwise, I probably won't remember that particular image that I did. Caddy, Cadillac, we're going to work on that image today. Um, cool Monks with Parasols, Cool Rickshaw Driver, Cool Taj for Taj Mahal. Disney at night. So these are, these are, these are incredible. Uh, I mean, presets are what these programs are all about. Because you want to work and do whatever you can. And then you want to be able to do a one click, hit it, and do it again if you want to the same thing or similar to another image. On this one, I'm going to go back to Crisp. I realize it's just too much. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to pull down my detail slider. First, I'll start with the boost, small details. Maybe I'll pull down Crisp right here. I mean, uh, strength. I, I think I'm going to probably pull down my adaptive saturation slider. But I might not do that yet. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with my brightness. And pull, there we go. I'm starting to get what I want. But now I realize, wow, it's a little too red. I'm going to close up details. And now, if this was too high, watch what happens to the face. Let me see if I can show you. The face starts to get blotchy. So you have to be really careful. Sometimes this evens out the tones. Sometimes it doesn't. So I'm going to pull it back to the left. And it's starting to look a little bit better. But there's still too much grit. So I'm going to open up details again. And I'm probably, I'm going to pull down the strength. And I hope I'm not going too fast, because I know there's a lag time. If I am, just let me know. And <clears throat> um, I'm going to play with the contrast a little bit. There we go. That, start, that, that kind of did it. And now, before and after. Pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, it gave me exactly what I wanted. I wanted these shadows in here. I wanted the depth of field, or the, the, the grit, the drama. Um, I wanted this almost three-dimensional feeling that I almost used a little bit of HDR, but didn't. Because this was nice, but I knew it was a good beginning point. So before and after. And now I can come in and tweak it. I still think there's, there's too much detail. So I'm probably, I'll try my boost right now. Oh, that softened it beautifully. So I work in little increments and get exactly where I want. And now what I can do is, let's just do it. Let's go save. And we'll say um, monk boy. Let's see, monk boy with um, oh, whatever. I'll just say monk boy by school, because that's where he was. And nature and landscape, I'm not sure. People and animals, there we go. OK. And now, where's my monk boy? Does anybody see my monk boy? Um, there he is. He's the last one. So what I could do is I could hit Linda at UCLA. I could hit the cool rookshaw driver. And then I can come cool monk boy. Let's see if it did the same thing. 
It's right there. <clears throat> That's the power of presets. You have another image you shot the same day in the same light and the same everything, then you can get it on the same kind of look on that image. I just love this. So hope that helped a little bit with uh, that little technique. Uh, I love shooting people. It's one of my favorite things. I think for a second here I'm going to segue into detail and just show you another cool little plugin. Uh, you guys make so many plugins. I mean, look at this. Look at this. This is amazing. This one company that charges so little for their stuff. Um, <laughs> I just I can't believe this the amount of stuff. And there's always updates. I'm serious. There's always updates. You don't even ask for it. They're, hey, by the way, we worked really hard, and now it's even better than it was. Thank you. So um, <laughs> it's an incredible company. It, it really is. I like everyone in the company except for uh, Nicole. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Kidding. Okay. So look at this. <laughs> um, Look at what happens when I when I when I use detail. See that little crispness that comes in. It's kind of a different feeling than if I went into Topaz Adjust, because it really brings out the detail. It brings out that grit. It brings out a little bit of drama, like I was going with the little boy. But this does it as though you had a better lens on your camera, or you cleaned your lens that day, or you were using a, a, a better camera. It's um, amazing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna flatten it. I'm going to pretend uh, it wasn't even there. This image doesn't need that much. Um, this is my pet leopard. He, he lives with me. And um, I'm going to go look for detail. I'm just kidding. This is in Africa. And um, it's already pretty sharp. I shot this with a 500 millimeter lens. It's already pretty sharp. I think I'm going to zoom in and look at his eyes, which is pretty good. I'm going to hit reset all. Now they have all these different little presets here also. Wow, they've got a, a black and white one. So this is, this is let, let's hit this one, desaturate blush. That is pretty cool. Actually, never used that one. But let me look at this. And I imagine if I bring up the saturation, now it, it's giving me almost a hand-tinted look right here. Not what I wanted to do, but that's why I like these presets. You can look at everything over here. Um, the one that I think I use the most, probably the most, uh, uh, I don't know, advantageous one that's really easy is to me is feature enhancement. I click on that, and now look at the before and after. It's really subtle. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Before and after, just a little bit. So I'm going to come into the medium detail, and I'm going to boost it a little bit more. I'm going to boost the small detail a little bit more. And now look again. Before, after. It's really cool. I'm going to try, try, try that large detail. It actually helped also. So I'm zooming in a little bit more. And now watch this, before and after. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, I, I moved all three of these puppies. And if I like it, I'll just go uh, leopard, close up, and tree. I'll leave it on nature and landscape unless there's an animals one. Oh, people and animals. Let's do that one. And now leopard close-up and tree is here. So I might want to use this for more of my Africa images, if I actually like this. But I shouldn't have saved it yet, because I'm not sure I like the rest of the image. So before and after. I'm going to pull down. And now, now I'm going to look at the background, because you have to keep an eye on the background. This leopard is going to hide a lot of the noise. But all of this little detail stuff might accentuate the noise. So before and after, it actually did just a little bit. So I might pull down my small boost a little, see if it did anything, maybe my small detail a little bit. And actually, I like it now. So let's go back and see how it looks before and after. Got rid of that background noise. The leopard looks good. And um, I could save this again as another preset, but I think it looks fine. I just tweaked these a little bit. I'm going to hit OK. There we go. Let's look at this full screen. I'll zoom in before and after. Before and after. Boom. Boom. I, I'm sorry. I just, I like, I, like, I really, Nicole, I really like detail. It's really cool I stuff. do too. It's my and favorite. Here, it's, cool. uh, it's incredible. Um, and, and 
I just want to let everybody know I'm not Mr. Expert with all of your stuff. I've been using it since almost the beginning, and they listen to a lot of things I have to say about it. I, I love being part of the team, but um, there are so many things when I watch things that you do with it or Ashley talk about it uh, that I'm like, whoa, I didn't know that. So there are so many things on the website. If you want to go in and see all of these webinars and videos, and you can learn so much more. When I watch them, I learn things like all the time. So I'm just showing you my workflow. I am not Mr. Expert with all their stuff because. I have to work with tons of stuff in here. I really do, and I have to write books and articles. So I'm trying everything, but I'm just telling you there are things I cannot live without. And if you put me on a deserted island with my camera and my computer, well, Topaz is on my computer. There's that's it. Um, so before and after with with this guy, I, I put him. I put him in front of. Uh, right in the middle of his village. It's really weird. These <clears throat> villages, they have like this. It's not barbed wire. It's like barbed. A brush. They have this brush, and they put it in a circle all the way around their village, so the lions won't come in at night and kill them. And this stuff is the most incredibly sharp, thorny stuff, and it's in a big circle. And then they move it out of the way, and then they can, they can leave during the day, and then they put it back so that the lions won't come and eat them at night, because uh, it would be easy pickings to kill all the kids in these villages. So it's pretty scary at night in these villages, and they live in the middle of nowhere. But I put him in front of. You can see it right here. Here is the the, the bush stuff. Um, so I'm going to turn this off. And I'm going to flatten it again. I'm going to make a layer copy. And I'm going to come into Topaz Detail. And, and I'm probably not even going to look for another preset. I'm probably going to go right into, I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit Reset All to, to begin with. But I'm probably going to go right into, am I in Detail? Where is that one? I mean, here it is, Leopard Close-Up. It alphabetized it or something. I'm not sure. I'm going to hit Leopard Close-Up. Look at that. Before and after. Oh my God, it's just so amazing. I'm going to pull it over here. So before and after. It's it sort of takes away this veil of fog that you think that you didn't even know you had, and that's what happens sometimes with topaz. Um, a lot of the time with topaz, but very often with detail. This is really minor. I mean, I can come up here to creative detail. It's a little bit too much. Micro contrast, too much. I can go, you know, here soft looking. Not gonna, not gonna do it for me. Do a little black and white, bold detail. But I'm gonna go into the one I just made, leopard close up, which was just a little bit more feature enhancement. And now I watch before and after. It's kind of like someone gave you a better lens and you didn't have to pay for it. I'm serious. That's how I look at it. Because people are all about buying these ridiculous megapixel cameras and this and that and thinking, oh, this is going to be so much better. No, it really comes down to not just the sensor, which is the most important thing, but it's also the lens that you get. So when I tell people, you know, spend your money wisely, buy good lenses. Don't buy inexpensive lenses. But if you do, you can always buy Topaz Detail and it'll make you look like your lens costs five times as much. So before and after, it really helps that much. So I'm just going to hit OK. and. One more time, before and after. It's subtle, and remember what I said, the key to Photoshop is being subtle. Do not let people think you've used Photoshop. I have to say the number one thing I see with all my students that they mess up with in Photoshop is over sharpening. I'm telling you, I my images are everywhere all over the world. They're, they're hanging everywhere, and they're on magazines and billboards and greeting cards. I have to give my stock agencies the best image as possible, and they not only don't want them sharpen, but they really, they really, they want them to look as realistic as possible. Um, they want the, the magazines to have the capability to sharpen them if need be. But most of the time, I'm using a Canon 5D Mark II. Um, literally, my workflow, whether I'm printing or whatever, most of the time I do little to no sharpening. The secret is using your tripod, using good gear, no camera movement, using your cable release, going out there with your travel photography and getting great images to begin with so you don't have to rely on Photoshop and any of these silly sharpening techniques. I like detail because it's sort of sharpening without sharpening. It's sort of like bringing up that clarity slider in RAW, but it does it in a different way that's more just almost realistic. And um, the secret is really good gear, good techniques, and then minimal Photoshop work, but use the right stuff. Let me just work on this for a second, and then you can ask me a question. This is an image. Uh, someone bought four of my images yesterday. Um, and this was one of the images, but this is not actually the final. This was the final right here. And I want to show you quickly how I did that. I used Adjust and Simplify. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to flatten this. This was in India. 
and uh, I just love shooting the painted elephants there. I'm going to hit layer copy. I didn't realize time flies when you're having fun. Oops. Um, I actually brought up uh, Simplify first, and I actually think I'd rather bring up Adjust first. So sorry that took a little bit of time. Let me flatten this again, make a layer copy, because I'm using both on this particular image. Let me hit Adjust first. What I want to do with this image, it was a little soft. This was early morning. I had to shoot indoors where they're, um, these weren't really cages. It was like a giant cave. I'm going to hit reset all. And there was really low light, and I think I couldn't even use a tripod. So it wasn't the sharpest shot that I ever had, and it was very low light. But what I, what I, want, to, what I want to do with this little, the, the, cool thing about, the cool thing about Simplify is that it's, um, it, it, it uses this uh, weird stuff called topological based simplification. And well, we'll, get, we'll get into that in Simplify afterward because it's such an important part of this image. But the, the, the first thing I want to do is just probably hit my favorite slider right here, my favorite preset, which is Photopop. And right off the bat, before, after, you could see what it did. I think, I think I might just pull adaptive exposure to the right just a bit, and that's all I want to do. I'm going to hit OK. I want it just a little bit of grit, and there it is. You see that? Before and after. It gave me just what I wanted. So I actually, I could just flatten it right now, make a layer copy, and go right into if I wanted to simplify it. And what I was saying about this, this topological based simplification, this, this program I used to use a long time ago, actually this, this technology, Human Software was this French company, and they came out with um, this software called Buzz Simplify. And I used to teach it all the time and have it, have it shown to my students. And it made these, look what you can see in a matter of seconds, it made these incredible, beautiful paintings. Let me try and open up the uh, presets here. And this company was ridiculous. They were French. They, they couldn't work on it bigger than a 29 megabyte file. It would always crash. Um, they, they had a smallest interface. It was incredible. For look, look at this look right off the bat. Um, and they, I would call them up and they'd go, oh, we don't know the problem. Why is crashing? Uh, we've never seen this before. All the time. They was like, whatever the problem was, I've never seen it before. I got so sick of them uh, and crashing all the time and not giving good customer support. And then one day all of a sudden my student wrote me and said, hey, they're, they're out of business. Their website's gone. They just left. Somehow, I mean, they left, and they didn't even care about their customers. Somehow, Eric and Albert at Topaz, they were able to figure out how they did this. Within time, they came out with it, and they still called it Buzz Sim, but they made the interface a million times better. They gave you all these controls, and you can work on huge files now without crashing. And so they saved the day, and they gave us this amazing program that lets you create incredible paintings that I absolutely love they, they, this, this way that it does it. It takes out the details based on their size, and I absolutely, I absolutely love this. So if I just hit, if I hit reset all, and then there's my original from Topaz Adjust, you can see all of these different presets. Some of them are pretty wacky. And if you want to not intensify the colors, you can get out of RGB and you can go into this color space. It keeps it a little more muted, but for this image, I'm going to keep it on RGB. I'm just going to hit Buzz Sim, and with a matter of seconds, this is what you see. Boom. Now it's given me these strokes, but it's a little bit too uh, too thick of strokes. So usually I come in here and I bring my simplify size down, and in a matter of seconds, all of a sudden the detail comes back, and there I am. I absolutely love this. I can push up my feature boost just a little bit, and before and after, and this is the image that people bought. They're putting it up huge in their living room. I'm not going to hit uh, OK because uh, you can see the before and the after, but there's all these other adjustments. You can come in here and boost the details and work on the saturation. And uh, there's this edge type stuff so that you can do all of these other amazing uh, things that you can do in this program. But I absolutely love the brush strokes the best. I'm going to hit cancel. And I'm going to, here, this is a good example of why you might want to use Simplify. Um, I shot this image in Yosemite. I was on a, a workshop with Art Wolf and a bunch of people. It was just an amazing time. Morning, shot up my, uh, set up my tripod. And you can see what I did. I did a, um, I did a half a second exposure. If I go into file info, five, half a second. The bummer was I got the look I wanted in the water, but there was a slight breeze blowing that morning I didn't feel, and it pushed the dogwoods over a little bit. So when I zoom in, they're slightly soft, and I'm so unhappy. So this is the perfect image to use for Simplify. So I'll make a layer copy. I'll come into Simplify. <coughs> and... 
Um, let me see. It'll use the last preset probably. Look, look at that. In a matter, how long did that take? Five seconds. I'm going to drag down my slider over here, the most important one, and pull it to the left. On this one, I'll probably change the colors to YCBCR. Uh, It'll mute them just a little bit more natural looking. Actually, I'm going to go back to RGB and see if I like it better. No, actually, I like RGB better on this particular image. Uh, I know Nicole likes the other one. I'm going to push Simplify to the left and watch. We're going to see more of these leaves come out. Did you see that? They just popped up out of nowhere. So if I zoom in, I can see a little bit more detail. And watch this. Before and after. Do you have a, another question, Nicole? Oh, I have tons of questions. <laughs> oh, go ahead. While I'm, while I'm working here, go ahead. I just okay. wanted to show them this before and after. I absolutely... Uh, I love this. This is a painting. I mean, you can you can take this and put it in your bathroom if you want. You know, hang it up. You can do give it to friends. I mean, it's fun to make your little bit of painted art. Go ahead. All right. So let's start up kind of mm -hmm. towards the top where. Okay. This is a question from Alan. He says, um, "Do you find the editing photos in this way take away from your original shot, or is this the image that you saw in your head when you took the shot and you're able to create it with this?" That's a great question, Alan. Mm -hmm. um, I take the fifth on that. Um, <laughs> I refuse to answer. Uh, it's it's weird. I, in the back of my mind, always, I have this like, wow, do I want to convert it to black and white? Because I always tell my students, I try and see and think in black and white also, because it's so powerful. Uh, do I want to add a little grit later? Um, how's the color intensity? I have it in the back of my mind, but mostly when I'm setting up and shooting it, I'm not thinking about any post-processing. I want to get it perfect in camera, and I can't tell you what a good feeling it is uh, so often when I bring my images into RAW, in camera RAW, and I have to do almost nothing. That's my ultimate goal. But sometimes I need to do a little bit of tweaking. In this example, <clears throat> this image right here is a perfect example of one right here. Um, this is an image that I um, that I, I really wanted to do. I actually, this is the Ubain Bridge in Burma, and I, I, I shoot here with my workshop students. Um, this is the longest teak bridge in the world, longest wooden bridge in the world, and it goes from one town to another, and every day people are walking across. I actually um, paid these girls and got these lanterns to, to do exactly what I wanted to do for this one, and I paid people with baskets, and this guy, I gave him a dollar, and he said, I want to give him a shot too with his bike. Um, and, and, um, Good time to ask the question. A few people are asking about model releases in foreign countries, how you go about that or handle that situation. Well, I have model releases everywhere. I'm a stock photographer. I have to have them, and everybody signs a model release wherever I am, and uh, sometimes I bring them in different languages, but in Burma, I don't have them in Burmese, so my my uh, guide always talks to them and gets them to sign them, and I come home with probably a stack that are at least an inch or an inch and a half thick, depending where I go. So it's a lot of uh, asking them and hoping they'll say okay and promising them pictures and paying them. I had to pay these girls. Each girl here got two bucks. So that was a lot of money for them for like a half an hour's work, and they got two bucks, and he got a dollar, so he was happy. So model releases are a must. If you want to download one, you can probably go to Getty or Corbis and download their master model release. Um, Getty probably has the strongest one in the world. That's probably uh, that's the one I always use. Um, but real, like this image right here, I, I, I had in my mind what I wanted to do. i um, shooting here, and um, I wanted to intensify the color. I'll have to show you a little trick. Um, I could go into Vibrance and in Photoshop and do things, but I really would prefer to do it with Simplify. I, I open up Simplify. It's a little trick I learned a long time ago. Open up Simplify, and I'll, I'll, hit, I'll hit Reset All. And it will back to my original image. If I click on it, no difference. Now, if I hit Buzz Sim, it will give me a better looking color scheme in here, but it will start to block up the shadows. So watch what happens to in, in this region in here. If I pull the slider all the way to the left, it starts bringing in that detail again. But it leaves that color intensity that I like. So uh, I, don't, I go into saturation. I back it off a little bit. And now, before and after. It's very much like using vibrance and different techniques, but I actually really like the way Simplify handles the color saturation, and I can't tell you how often I use this. I turn off all of the, 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 the artistic effect, and I just increase the saturation in before and after. Before and after. And this image is now hanging up uh, four feet by six feet in the United Nations. So uh, Simplify has an image up in the United Nations. So it's really, it's really cool, and I use that technique in there. And um, do I have time to show uh, one other thing, really, right here? Yeah. Can I ask a couple oh, questions as absolutely. you bring it up? Don't have. 
<laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, I just realized I don't have the right image. I have the after. I don't have the before. So um, before you ask that, let me just tell you one thing. This image was shot on the Rialto Bridge in, uh, it's in Italy, in Venice. And I, I should have showed you the before. I don't know how that got thrown away. But it was a terrible time of the day. The light was terrible. My friend and I just drove there from Slovenia just for a few hours. The weather was bad. And I know when, when Alan asked about do you know about post-processing, I knew in my head with this horrible light image and every, everything yucky, Simplify is going to give me a beautiful little painting that I can give to friends and I can mess around with. It's not going to probably make me a lot of money unless you know I really uh, sell it to the right places, but I really uh, liked what it did. It, it intensified the colors. It made a nice little uh, painting over here. Uh, and, and I could have brought back in more detail over here. So this is the after of a really horrible image. So go ahead with your other question. Okay, I'm just going to ask a couple here as, as we go down. Um, the first is if you're going to be updating your, um, your book anytime soon, if that's going to come out with a new version or a new update. Mm -hmm. Well, I, mean, I just actually talked to my editor a couple of days ago, and we're trying to decide whether uh, whether we want to do that or not. So uh, I'm okay. hoping to because I want to put a whole bunch of topaz stuff in there that didn't get put in there in the first edition. I was really unhappy about. But good question. All right. Uh, let's see here. Oh, where do you do classes around um, in workshops around the world? We have some people asking from New Zealand, uh, UK. Yeah, I've done them all over from the Galapagos to Africa to. Uh, God, wherever I just I love it in France. But right now um, I'm kind of concentrating on doing my own workshops. So I do them to Death Valley, which is near where I live in Los Angeles, and also in Burma. And I might do some. I'm you know other people are asking me to do other workshops. So um, I'm just getting too busy. I'm teaching too much. I'm in too many classes. And UCLA asked me to teach another class yesterday. It's going to take eight weeks of my time. I'm like pulling my hair out. So um, does that information right now, uh, show up on your uh, yeah on my website? website. Go to ASA100.com. You can read about it. Okay, great. And I have a, um, a couple others here. Uh, do you shoot in JPEG or RAW? And what are you using okay, right now? Okay, who asked that question? <laughs> who asked um, that question? Let's see. We have a few people who asked it. <laughs> J J J JPEG is a dirty word. When, when digital cameras came out, um, God, I got my first one in 2001, right before I went to Burma. Um, and uh, that was the only way we could shoot in JPEG. So it was just a no-brainer. that We had no other choice. But I forget, I think it was around Photoshop version 6. I can't remember exactly, maybe 7, when they came out with RAW. And that changed everything. RAW is your digital negative, And once you shoot in RAW and you have anything serious that you want to keep, like this image right here of this cool dude in the Pushkar Camel Festival in India, um, it, once you shoot in RAW, you'll probably never want to shoot in JPEG again. In JPEG, you have literally so few adjustments compared to what you have in RAW. And the secret to uh, RAW is that uh, nothing's been done to your image. If you shoot in JPEG, everything has been done by the camera. If you have a Canon camera or a Nikon camera or Sony, the camera manufacturer dictates to you what that JPEG is going to be like. So all your contrast, all your toning, um, all your uh, compressing, uh, the, the whole tone of the image is all done by Canon, Nikon, Sony, Olympus, or whatever. And that's what they think your image should look like. So once you come in the Photoshop, you can't use uh, Camera Raw anymore or Raw in Lightroom. You have to start using just Photoshop. So there are so many things that don't work the same. And the latitude is absolutely ridiculous. So it really is like taking your bike to the beach or taking a Ferrari to the beach. It's the only way I could correlate it. It's that much of a difference. Now, much of the time, you won't see the difference if you're not really critical. But if you really want to work on things like your color temperature and the clarity and removing noise and all of these things that add up to an image that could be blown up for a billboard or, or be on the front cover of a magazine, you have to do the best you can. And literally, nobody is going to want you to originally have shot it as a JPEG. But they will take a JPEG from you after you've done all of your shooting. So I shoot in RAW. And half of my agencies want JPEGs, and half of them want TIFFs, and, and, uh, and, and that's how it works. A lot of the agencies like the JPEGs now, um, and a lot of them say, no, we still want TIFFs. So that's the way it works. Shoot in RAW, but send out either in Photoshop, TIFF, or JPEG. OK, a couple questions about your setup when you're on site. Um, first of all, do you always? While you're asking me. Yeah, go ahead. While you're asking me, can I, just, can I work on this uh, yeah. in Topaz? Yeah. You, people can kind of watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up a just to show them the before and after. This is the after. Here's the before. So go ahead. Um, first, do you use a tripod always? Second, do you um, uh, do you actually take a larger screen with you when you shoot, like an iPad or your computer, so you can see it immediately during? Huh. That's a that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, 
I bring a laptop with me. The iPad still, to me, hasn't um, hit the mark exactly. Uh, I really want USB on there, so I'm hoping that the iPad 3 will have USB port. Um, I don't like that silly little port they have on the bottom. And then you have to buy all these other accessories to work with it. Um, I think the iPad's going to be crucial later. I don't think it is now, so I don't bring my laptop out in the field. What I rely on is my loop. I use a loop the same way we used to use for uh, looking at negatives and slides. It has to be 4x powered. Um, I love great loops. Um, but unfortunately, they're hardly made anymore. Peak makes a good one, P-E-A-K, makes a good 4x four four loop. And it lets you put it on the back of your screen and, and magnify and keep out, if you put the black piece of the loop on instead of the clear piece, they send you both. Um, that's the one that was made for proof sheets. You can really zoom in and see your image, and that helps me more than anything. I don't have to have an iPad or a laptop near me. Now, there's a company called, um, um, it, uh, Hoodman makes a loop. Uh, which I absolutely do not like. And I'll be the first to tell them. I've told them, um, I think there's three owners there. I think I might have talked to two. Said, you have a good package here. It's three inches. It fits on the display really well. It's rubber. It's got a string that's detachable. But they refuse to put in a 4X powered magnification. So they've absolutely ruined what could have been the best loop in the world, which would have been probably the number one accessory that I show my students. Everybody goes and buys a loop after they see what it can do. Um, so Hoodman kind of has missed the boat. I'm hoping in the future they wake up. And um, but just if you can go on Amazon and look under PEAK loop L O U P E. Look at their 4X loop. They're about 60 or 70 bucks. Comes with a string. Put it around your head. Make sure you put on the black piece. Put on some tape so it doesn't scratch your LCD. I use gaffer's tape. And then take some images. It's a little smaller than three inch. You have to move it a little bit. That's why I like the Hoodman size, but I don't like the Hoodman's magnification. And then it will it will show you your images so much better wherever you are. If you have dust in your sensor and you're outside, boom, you can see it. If the sun is out, you can't see your screen. The, the, the loop completely hides all of the sun, shows you your image, so wherever you are, you can see your image the second you've taken it. And once you've used the loop for digital photography, I guarantee you will be spoiled. On my workshops, everybody wants to borrow my loops. Everybody. We're on the sand dunes shooting in Death Valley in the sun, and they're kind of borrow your loop. And I'm like, okay, but I need it back because I can't see my image. It's a LCD in, in full sun is ridiculous. So anyway, that's what I use. I don't use an iPad. I use my loop. Okay. What about a tripod? And um, Walt actually just uh, expanded on the question. He said, uh, do you feel like a tripod might restrict your creativity? Um, absolutely not. Uh, if you look at any of the true uh, greats in photography from – from Ansel Adams to Galen Roll to Art Wolf to uh, Thomas Mengelson. I mean, all of the, the great people uh, that, that go out there and, and work on this stuff. Um, I use a tripod, I would say, 80% of the time. It goes with me everywhere. I have images of my motorcycles when I'm in Greece with the tripod on the back hooked on. Wherever I go, my tripod goes. And um, it's probably, in my opinion, the number one thing that will turn you into a better photographer. Because what it will do, instead of restricting you, um, I mean, I'm not a photojournalist, so if I was a photojournalist, I would absolutely be restricted with a tripod and having to take it everywhere. <clears throat> but I want to set up shots. With this shot right here, um, I actually can't even remember if I used a tripod. On shots like this, yes, sometimes you can be restricted because he's moving and blah, 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 blah. Uh, I'm actually working on this image as I'm talking to you. I'm just, uh, uh, I brought it in to use Spicify and before and after, just tweaking the saturation a little bit so you can see. And how, how powerful this is. Um, I, I use a tripod a lot because it'll help you align the background. It'll help you get exactly every corner, exactly what you want. Everything's in there because when you click that shutter and your hand holding, the next shot is not going to be the same. You might have moved the camera a little bit. You might have changed the focus. You might have made the horizon not as level. So when you're shooting on a tripod and you finally get it perfect and you tighten it down, that's it. That is your canvas. That's the same way you, were, you put a canvas on an on a easel and you're painting every corner of that painting and everything. That's it. It's not moving around. So your, your, your canvas is on an easel. Your camera should be on a tripod. I've never said that before. Right now, it, it works perfectly, the correlation between the two. The, your art basically it was the beginning of photography. All of photography came from, from painting and artwork. So you're sort of creating your own art every time you're out there. And if you're on a tripod, your photography skills and your level are going to go up the same way using layers and layer masks in Photoshop are going to make you go through the roof. So the one thing I tell all my students, I don't care where they are, any workshop they're coming with me, any class, get a tripod because that you buy a camera, you need a tripod. It's the people that are kind of lazy or they know they don't need one because they're being a photojournalist and they don't want to walk in somewhere with it, then that's fine. I never tell anybody uh, 
that, that they have to have a tripod. I'm just telling them, you want to improve your photography, you need a tripod. And by the way, can you see right. the dust? I mean, the, the dust in the sensor up here? Mm -hmm. and I, I wasn't looking through my loop that particular <laughs> moment. There's another piece of dust down here. So anyway, there's a before and after. Um, it kind of shows Topaz adjust. And this was actually used on the back of, uh, back of Photoshop User Magazine for an ad for you guys. You remember yes, that one, actually? Yes. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, mm -hmm. One more question or two more questions. Um, sure. How easy is it to get contacted with agencies for selling stock photos? Paul had that question. I think it's a great one for you. Okay. How easy is it for them to contact you or for you to contact the agency? Um, <laughs> well, I'll well, tell there you one. You <laughs> okay, well, forget about sitting there and waiting for your for the door to ring. Uh, you might as well, you know, you know, whatever. Hope that you're going to win the lottery. That doesn't happen. Okay, you have to either be recommended by somebody, uh, which happened to me years ago with uh, Corbis, which was great. Um, you have to uh, knock on a lot of doors. <clears throat> you have to be a great photographer. In my opinion, you have to be very creative in Photoshop and very, very almost gifted. Um, you've got to be better than than your neighbor. You have to be really, really good, and you have to not take no for an answer. It's the same way if you want to be an actor. So the door ain't going to ring for you. There, there, unless you're exceptional and you've started new techniques and campaigns and things where people are really noticing you, it's probably not going to happen. You need to be creating great stuff and then knock on their doors. And I would have to tell you if <clears throat> the one book that's the Bible that you have to buy is the photographer, the photographer's um, market. It's the it's the number one book in the world. It's about twenty four ninety five, maybe a little cheaper on Amazon. That's the number one book in the world that will show you every person in the world. Every year it's updated. Every person in the world that wants to buy your images. So mm -hmm. if you can't buy anything else, buy the photographer's market and uh, look in there. Every stock agency, every gallery, every uh, greeting card company, every every thing that you can think of is in this book uh, because that's why you're paying for it every year a different version because they update it. So um, if that was Paul or whoever asked them, that's what you that's what you want to do. You want to buy that book. You want to really work on your stuff. And I, I cannot tell you, <clears throat> I really cannot tell everyone out there enough how much I rely on Topaz. It is just absolutely amazing software. I mean, my agency took this image and look, that was the original one. So they like this actually backed off a little bit. It's a little, little intense, and in you know, play with it. I I do not like over processing images. But if you looked at this, and I back off the color a little bit, a little bit of the shine, you really, I mean, look look at the, look at his turban. Look at the difference there. You, you really sometimes don't know if you do this correctly that you're using really good third-party software that didn't originally come in Photoshop, and that's why I've been an advocate and wrote books about it and articles and Shutterbug, and and I love showing what some of these other companies can do because there are some great people out there that make software for Photoshop. And yes, the only disadvantage it costs you money, but who cares? <laughs> you buy Photoshop, you buy a camera, right? You can buy another lens. Yeah, you buy Photoshop, you buy software, you know, plug-in. So it's the same way. You you buy your car, maybe you're going to buy something to improve your car. It's like once you buy it doesn't mean it's over. You want to make it even better. You know, you buy a nice suit, don't you need new shoes? This is the way it works. You buy one, you have to spend the money on the other. So, and I have to tell you, out of all the companies out there, and I know them all. I work with them all. I'm a beta tester for almost everyone. Uh, Topaz has the most ridiculous prices in the world. In fact, I'm one of the reasons it went from $39 to adjust for $49. I told Eric, listen, I'm going to work on all this stuff and help you. You got to charge more money. This is this is seeming too cheap. Really good software costs about $100 to $200, and he was charging too little. And um, I said go to at least to $49, and he did within a couple of weeks, and he said it didn't hurt sales at all, and probably they're doing fine right now. But you really get what you pay for, and at $49 for this software to do this, yeah, you can maybe figure out how to do it yourself in Photoshop. You want to do it in five seconds, or you want to spend like a half an hour trying to figure this out? So this is, for the money, Is there's nothing that even can come close. I mean, you can do HDRs yourself, but I use this software in conjunction with my HDRs, not um, sometimes and sometimes instead of, but also in conjunction with. But I'm telling you, for the money, simplify, adjust all of them, detail. It's absolutely crazy with uh, how little they charge. And one last question that keeps popping up, and yes, I know you'll have an answer. Um, what is your favorite lens mm -hmm. that you're using, especially with these um, really shallow depth of field ones, like the one we're looking at now? Well, that's an easy one. My 70 to 200 2.8. That's my workhorse lens. I have everything from a 14 
which is rectilinear, no distortion, to my 15, which is a fisheye, which is curved. I have uh, several 50s from macro to 1.4s. Um, I have 300. I have a 100 to 400. Uh, I have my 500 f4, which is my beast that I absolutely love. But I have to tell you, the lens that I use for portraits, that I use for animals, that I use more often than not is on when I travel is my 70 to 200 2.8. <clears throat> now it's expensive. Nikon has the same thing. If you want to get something almost well, so similar, but much less money. Um, much lighter and smaller than you get the 70 to 200 f4. Now, I'm mostly shooting my 70 to 200 at f4, or even a little bit uh, higher. I, I, once in a while, of course, I'm shooting at f2.8, and you get a brighter viewfinder because it's a fast lens. But if you want to save some money and get the most amazing lens, it might even be sharper than the 2.8. It's the f4. So for $1,100, I think it is, you get a 7200 f4 with a four-stop image stabilizer built in. You will um, lose a little bit of light because it's an f4, but um, you know, usually you buy a lens and you want to shoot it at a stop or two down to get the ultimate clarity. Most of us won't even see that. So I would have to say uh, you want to save some money, get the 7200 f4. If you don't mind the bulk and the weight and the money, get the 7200 2.8. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was really great. There was jam-packed with information and I think that's just incredible and that we needed to know all that so thank you so much you're welcome I'm telling you I love this software for my travel photography it is it's just essential so thanks Nicole thanks Ashley and you guys are the best all right well, we'll be talking to you soon okay bye-bye bye everybody